It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, so this is a picture of a woman named Marianne Doe, and if you are an NFL fan, you may recognize her as the super fan from the Chargers game a few weeks ago on Monday Night Football. It was October 16th, and the Cowboys were playing the Chargers in L.A., and Marianne Doe was not only all over the Jumbotron, she was all over TV. So it's late in the game, it's fourth quarter, uh, the Cowboys are ahead 17 to 10, and the Chargers are at the goal line. They're on the one yard line with seven minutes left in the game, and it's fourth down. So they have a decision to make. Either they can kick a field goal, hopefully get three points, they're still down four points, or they can go for a touchdown. Now, if they go for a touchdown, if they try for a touchdown and they don't get it, they get zero points and they're still down seven points with seven minutes left in the game. And so they have a decision. What are we going to do? This is the play that they ran at that moment. <clears throat> they fake the handoff. Everett wide open. Touchdown, L.A. So as you would expect, the crowd goes berserk, and the one who has the most energy is Marianne Doe. She is the one who is all over TV during that moment, before and after, showing the emotional intensity of the game. Go ahead and take a look. Hands, it's a walk-in. Fourth down, and goal. Just pure ecstasy for this Chargers fan as the Chargers have tied it at 17. If there's a definition of pure ecstasy, that's a pure. <laughs> now, as you might expect, as the internet does, the internet goes berserk over this lady. I mean, everybody has so many questions, so many opinions. She's going viral. And some of the things that people are saying was surely she has to be a plant meaning she has to be a paid actor. There's no way anybody has that much energy, especially for the Chargers, <laughs> at any point in the season, right? Like, surely she is not real. Some people were even saying she's probably some AI-generated footage that just gets <laughs> slipped into the broadcast. There is no way that she can be real. So over the next couple of days, all of these sports talk shows start to reach out to her and they say, we have to know who you are, we have to know your story, because she was everywhere on national TV throughout the whole game. And so she went on a couple different talk shows and she's like, this is just me, I'm just a stay-at-home mom, I used to work, but now I stay with my kids, I love the Chargers, we go to a bunch of games, and I just cheer like that all the time. And so people were like, okay, well, well, maybe this is legit. Maybe she is just a crazy Chargers fan, and she just loves life to the fullest. And people were saying, you know, we probably need more Marianne Does in the world to give us some inspiration that there's still things worth cheering for in life, right? Then another day or two goes by, and then this picture of her surfaces on the internet. This is a picture of her at an LA Rams game wearing Vikings gear, Ugh, Vikings, right? Ugh. Although we wish Kirk Cousins the best in his recovery Ugh, to the Vikings. And they're like, wait, 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 she's in LA at the Rams game. See, this just proves she's an attention seeker. She's probably getting paid. Who, who could have the integrity to cheer like that for the Chargers as well as show up in Vikings gear. So people start reaching out to her again, like, hey, what's the story here? And she's like, okay, this is the deal. I grew up in Minnesota, and I grew up loving the Vikings. But then I moved to California like 20 years ago and just had to choose a local team. So I do still cheer for the Vikings, but the Chargers have my first allegiance. And so people are saying, okay, maybe, but maybe she's still just an attention seeker. So then, a week goes by. Now it's week seven, October 22nd. The Chargers are going to Kansas City to play the Chiefs. And who should show up at that game? Not in LA, in Kansas City, Marianne Doe, right? And where is she sitting? 
She is sitting in the front row cheering for the Chargers. As intense, as crazy, as excitable as she was back in LA. But the thing that everybody noticed was not only her, but everybody who was sitting with her was wearing Buffalo Wild Wings gear, kind of implying that Buffalo, the reason she's at that game is because Buffalo Wild Wings probably paid for her to get there, probably paid for her seats, and said, hey, wear all this stuff because they know she's going to get on national TV. And so everybody's saying, like, see, see, is she true, a true fan? Like, is she truly devoted or is she attention seeker and just simply opportunistic? Is she truly devoted or is she simply opportunistic? We're in a series right now that we're calling This is Meadowbrook. And the purpose of this series is to simply drill down on our mission statement to really remind ourselves of who we are as a church. And the reason we're doing this is because just in a week or, you know, maybe 10 days, we're going to start to see lots of activity on our property as our building renovation starts to get underway. We've been talking about it all year, that we as a church want to make the most of this building. We want to use this building to the fullest so that as more people come into our space, we have better opportunity to, to reach people for Jesus. And that's going to start real soon. And one of the things that happens when churches do additions and renovations is they can easily lose sight of what they're called to do. It can easily become all about the new shiny building rather than the mission to which God has called us. And so we're simply focusing on our mission statement for this series, showing who we are as a church and how the early church operated in the same way. And our mission statement, if you've never seen it, is this. Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus and become his fully devoted followers who influence the world. Now, we often say that there are four words that carry the weight of our mission statement, those four words being invite, discover, become, and influence. And this week, we're zeroing in on become. But it raises the question, if we want you to become something, what is it that we want you to become? And what our statement says is we want you to become fully devoted, a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And the question surfacing around this woman, Mary Ann Doe, is she truly devoted or is she just opportunistic, is also true for us. Like, are we truly devoted to Jesus or are we just opportunistic? Meaning, I'm here for what Jesus can do for me. I'm here so that I can have assurance that I'll get into heaven when I die. I'm here because I'm longing for some sort of healing or restoration. I'm here because I'm after peace and comfort in the midst of my challenge. Are we opportunistic just wanting something from Jesus? Or are we truly devoted to him because of who he is, the true king of kings and true lord of lords over the entire universe? And our passage today shows us what it means to be devoted and asks us the question whether or not that is true of us. Are we also truly devoted? And this is how our passage begins. This is chapter 4 of Acts, starting in verse 1. We read, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now, chapter 4 picks up literally right where chapter 3 finishes. It's all one moment in the book of Acts. It just happens to be divided by a chapter marker. And what happens in chapter 3 of Acts is Peter and John, along with the rest of the disciples, are going into the temple for daily prayer, and they see a lame man who's begging for money, and he gets the attention of Peter and John, and Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold I don't have. I don't have any money to give you, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And this lame beggar, who's over 40 years old, who's never used his legs a day in his life, has always been carried around everywhere he went his entire life, instantly in that moment finds his legs and his ankles strengthened and he jumps to his feet and begins to walk. 
Now, naturally, the crowds in the temple get word of this, and people start to flock to this new miracle in this guy who's walking for the first time. And Peter wastes no opportunity, and he begins to preach to the crowd. And the thing he's preaching about is the connection that this miracle has to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the resurrection, Jesus ushers in new creation. He's bringing in a new world. And this man is being swept up in that new creation. And he too physically is being made new. And so while the crowds are both mesmerized by the miracle and the words of Jesus, not everyone in the temple is on board with this. Because we read in verse 2 this, they, being the guards and the religious leaders, were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now, in verse 2, we're told that the guards of the temple and the leaders, who were the Sadducees, were greatly disturbed. Now, we might read this and be like, hey, what's the big deal? We're a group of people uh, here in America who value free speech. Anybody can get up anywhere and say whatever they want. But there's a few things happening for why the temple officials were greatly disturbed. We're told that the religious leaders who were there are a group of people known as the Sadducees. They would have been like an elite group of aristocrats, power brokers, religious power brokers of the day, essentially priests who ran the workings of the temple. And if you have this massive crowd, maybe even to the number of a thousand or more, because when we read the end of chapter 2, we read, because of what happened in chapter 2, the number of disciples grew to 3,000. And here, in chapter 4, we're told that the number of disciples grew to 5,000. Now, even if you're not that good at math, you can easily figure out that's a difference of 2,000 people. So it could have been that hundreds, if not thousands of people in this moment saw what happened, heard what Peter said, and were like, I'm in. I'm going to follow Jesus. And so you have this massive stir in the temple. But the other reason why the Sadducees would not appreciate what Peter and John are doing is that they are proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Also, implication, those who follow Jesus one day will also be resurrected. And the, fair, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They're like, no, ain't anybody going to get raised from the dead. Not Jesus and not any of you. There is no resurrection. And so they're trying to put a stop to what Peter and John, Peter and James are doing. It, it would be like if somebody was here on a Sunday morning and they get up to preach and they start preaching the tenets of Buddhism or Hinduism and reincarnation and I'm sitting in the front row, I'd be like, uh -uh -uh, we're going to shut this down. That's not at all what we believe in. So the Sadducees and the temple guards are putting a stop to what Peter and James are doing. They put them in jail overnight, and then in the next morning, this is what happens. Verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas. Remember those two names. John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family were also there. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or name did you do this? Now, there's a major assumption behind their question. And that assumption is there is no way that the two of you could have done this. So, by what name or power did you do this? And Peter doesn't push back on that. Peter doesn't challenge that. Peter's the first one to say, you're right. Like, we didn't do it. You're right. It, it wasn't by our own power that we did it. And he goes on to say this in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you, 
and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Now, no doubt that the first followers of Jesus in the book of Acts were devoted to what was going on. I mean, you read it on every page. Their devotion was amazing. But the reason they had the devotion that they did was because of their conviction. Their devotion started with conviction. And specifically, they had conviction around the name of Jesus. When you read through the first four chapters of Acts, this phrase, the name of Jesus, is repeated. And all sorts of things are being attached to it as to what happens in and through that name. Like chapter 2, Peter preaches on Pentecost, the Spirit comes, everybody hearing is amazed, and the response is, what must we do in response to what you're saying? And Peter says, be baptized, you and your entire household, in the name of Jesus. And then when Peter heals the lame man in chapter 3, and he starts to preach to the crowds again because they're like, whoa, what happened? He says, whoa, it is by faith in the name of Jesus that this man was healed. And then here in chapter 4, the Sadducees and the religious leaders are asking the question, by what power or by what name? Because you don't have the power or the authority to do this. And they say, you're right. Is the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. And then Peter's going to go on in this next few verses and attach salvation to that phrase. He says this in verse 11. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so essentially... What Peter is saying is that, yeah, we didn't do it. Jesus is the one who did it. He's the one who has the power. He's the one who has the authority. He is the one who makes things work. And what he's saying is that Peter and James were, and we are merely representatives of Jesus in the here and now. But what that means, it's not our power, it's not our authority. We do have power. We do have spiritual authority, but it's not our own. It comes to us from Jesus. It's his power, it's his authority working in and through us. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to do a funeral for a veteran. And it was a really moving ceremony, really moving funeral. And after the luncheon, the family and I went to the cemetery to do the burial. And because he was a veteran, he got military honors um, at the burial, which if you've never seen military honors given to a veteran, it, it's moving, it's honorable, it's very, very powerful. And one of the things that they do is whoever the, the soldiers or the officers who are conducting this part of the ceremony is they usually come with a flag. And the flag's folded up into a triangle and they unfold this flag and they present the flag for everybody to see. And then you often hear in the distance a 21-gun salute of guns firing. And then usually even further in the distance, you hear taps being played. And after all the guns have been fired and after the music has stopped, the soldiers holding the flag come back together and they fold it meticulously, creasing every edge, making sure every corner is tucked in just right with great care and precision. And then one of the soldiers brings the flag to the widow and presents it to them. And when they present the flag, they say something to the effect of, of this, on behalf of the President of the United States, we present to you this flag as a token of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. Now, I've seen that done a handful of times at funerals that I've officiated but on this day, the officer who was presenting that flag and who was saying those words had such conviction and authority with the way they said it. I mean, they bent down, looked right in the widow's eye, 
And they said it as though, just a few minutes prior, they were on the phone with the President of the United States himself. And he was saying to this soldier, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say these words. And I want you to let this woman know, from me personally, the gratitude that I have for the sacrifice that her husband gave for this country. I mean, he had such power and such authority. It, it, and regardless of what you think of the sitting president at any given time, like there's something weighty to those words, that office, that name, that authority, that power being called on. It was as though he was there himself. And we as Christians, like carry similar authority. We actually carry greater authority than the President of the United States because we carry the power and the authority of the King of the universe. And what happens is when you're able to see and identify the work of God in your life, and when it's irrefutable, like this moment in chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Acts is, because we're told in verse 14 that the guy who was healed he was standing right there. He could say with his own mouth, yeah, I was lame, and now I walk. I used to be carried around everywhere, but now I get around on my own. I used to beg for money, but I don't have to anymore because Jesus has changed my life, and I'm going to go get a job and become a contributing member to society. When you see the work of God in your own life, and it's irrefutable, it gives you this strong conviction that the things we believe are true. This isn't just a made-up story. It's not as though we just believe these things to make ourselves feel better. Like, there's a new world that is going to overtake this world. Everything sad will become untrue one day because of what Jesus has done and the new world he started at the resurrection. And so here's the question. Where is God at work in your life? Where are you able to see that he's present He's with you. He's changing things. He's affecting things. Your reality is different today because of what Jesus has done in your life. Not just 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. Not a couple of years ago when you became a Christian, but today. And when you see that, it gives you this strong conviction that what we believe is true. And over time, hopefully what happens is that your conviction grows into courage. Because notice what the religious leaders say in response to Peter, or what they observe. When they saw the courage of Peter and John. Like the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the temple guards, they can see their courage. And the courage that they're noticing is the degree to which Peter is being confrontational with them. Because if you back up to verse 8, when Peter starts to speak, his words are initially polite and respectful. He says, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, but then he gets explicit and gets direct, then know this. It's almost as though you can feel the emotional intensity heat up because he goes on to say, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified. Peter is picking a fight. Now, if you've been reading all the way through, you'll notice that this isn't the first time that Peter has used that phrase or that idea, Jesus whom you crucified. If you go back to chapter 2, in his Pentecost sermon, he says that to the crowds. He says in chapter 2, verse 23, you, all of you people who are listening, you, with the help of wicked men, put him, him being Jesus, to death. And then he does something similar in chapter 3 when he preaches after the lame man is healed. Verse 13, he says, you handed him over to be killed. And then he's repeating the you. And you disowned him before Pilate. Verse 15, he says, you killed the author of life. Repeatedly, he's saying to the crowds, this is what you did. Now, the difference between those moments and what's happening in chapter 4, as I said, we're told that Annas 
and Caiaphas are in the room with Peter and John. And when he says, you, he's not using the general plural, you. He's using a very specific you. And he's saying to Annas and Caiaphas, it is you and it is you who put Jesus to death. Because when you go back and read the Gospels, it is Annas and it is Caiaphas who are creating this plot to kill Jesus. When Jesus is arrested, he is brought to Annas. He is brought to Caiaphas. He's not brought to some random religious leaders. He's brought to these two men. And so when Peter says, it is you who Jesus crucified, you who crucified Jesus, he's directly talking to them. Talk about courage, right? Talk about guts. Like, I'm not going to back down to anybody. Now, sometimes when it comes to courage, we perceive that courage is reserved for those who are elite in what they do, who are unique, who are special, who are somehow set apart from the rest of the world. And when I think of people who have courage, and when I think of people who are elite in what they do, the first people who come to mind are Navy SEALs. I mean, Navy SEALs have some of the most incredible courage of people I know. N not just because of what they are called to do, but the courage and the guts that they have to have just to go into train to be a Navy SEAL is over the top. Early on in their training, they have something called Hell Week. And Hell Week is designed to weed out those who don't have what it takes to be a Navy SEAL. For seven days, they will run, walk, hike, almost 200 miles. That's eight marathons. Like, I can barely do a half of a marathon, and I train for that for months on end, let alone eight full marathons. They, they will carry the weight of poles, telephone poles. They will sit with them. They will sit in water for hours on end through the night to acclimate their body to the ter wor most worst and terrible conditions. And then they have to learn how to swim without their hands or their feet. When I teach my kids to swim, all I tell them to do is use your hands and use your feet because that's how you swim. But they have to figure out how to swim with their hands tied behind their back and their feet tied. And they do all of this on four hours of sleep. Not four hours of sleep per night, four hours of sleep over the course of a week, which means they don't sleep. Like, Talk about elitist. Like, I could probably barely make it through an hour. I'd be like, I'm done. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of you, but I cannot do this, right? And so we think that courage is reserved for those who are elite and receive special training. And sometimes we think that's true in our spiritual life. It's the people who are going overseas. It's the people who go through serious training. It's the people who go through serious study that are courageous. But notice again, what these religious leaders observe about Peter and John. It says in verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were ordinary. There was a system to become one of the religious elites of their day. And the reason Peter and John are not one of the religious elites is probably because they couldn't hack it. Their academic skills weren't up to snuff. They, they were not picked for rabbinic school. They were told, just go study the family trade because you don't have what it takes to be a high priest. But what we're told here is that courage isn't reserved for the elite. It's reserved for everyday, ordinary followers of Jesus. And sometimes we think courage means that we don't have fear, that, that we just aren't afraid of anything. It's the absence of fear. And we're not told the fear level of Peter in this moment, but we know that Peter has been in a similar situation like this before. He's actually been on the fringe of one of these moments before. Because when you go back to the Gospels and Jesus is arrested and tried, where's Jesus or where's Peter? He's right outside the trial hanging out by a fire. Where earlier that day he said to Jesus, even if you die, I'll go with you. I'll give my own life for you. And what happens to Jesus? After he's tried, he's crucified, he dies. And what does Peter do during the trial? He denies Jesus. He's scared out of his mind because what's going to happen to him? Whatever is going to happen to him, 
What could happen to me? And now he's in one of those exact same moments. And you got to believe, he could be thinking, I don't know what these guys are going to do. I've already seen them string up Jesus and kill him because of who he was. What's to say they won't do that again now? And so courage isn't reserved for the elites. It's for everybody. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to walk into your fear and to trust that as you go in it, God is with you and will help you through it. And so a few minutes ago we said, where is God at work in your life? Where is he at work in your life? And maybe you hear that question like, I don't know. I don't even know how to know. Like, how do I find that out? I would say start with your fear. Follow your fear. Where your fear is, God is in it with you. He may not be causing the fear. He's not trying to scare you, but he's with you in it. He might even be inviting you into the thing that scares you to say, walk through it. Trust me in it because we are going to get through it and you'll be stronger and more devoted on the other side. And so courage in this moment comes from the conviction that these men have, but it also comes from connection, specifically their connection with Jesus. Because we read, again, at the end of verse 13, these men were astonished. They saw that they were ordinary men, and they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Devotion ultimately comes from connection. Now, there are Christians out there who who will hear stories and read stories like this, and they will say that our primary calling in life is to be confrontational, right? Peter's confronting the powers that be. We are called to confront the powers that be. We have the truth. The world needs to hear the truth, and so it's our responsibility to tell them the truth, right? and I don't care what happens, and I don't care who I offend. Now, maybe at times you could say, yeah, that is our calling. There's also something we're called to called compassion that sometimes gets overlooked. That's woven into it as well. But what sometimes we fail to miss is that the primary calling that we have with Jesus is not a calling to be confrontational, but to be relational, specifically, first and foremost, with Him. Our primary calling is relationship to Jesus. If you go to Mark 3, Jesus spends the entire night praying, praying to God, of who should I call to be my disciples? The next morning, he comes to all the people who are, who are his followers, and he chose 12, the 12 that he wanted. And it says that first and foremost, he called them to be with him. Ultimately, so that he could train them, so that he could send them out to preach, so that they could go out into the world and heal the sick. But their primary calling was relationship, was to be with Jesus and experience the unfailing love that he has for them. And the significance is, when life gets hard, the first thing we look to is relationships. The who in our life who are going to help us get through the hardship that we're facing. And what we have in Jesus is a relationship more secure, more steadfast, more committed to us than we could ever imagine. You you could say it this way, that relationship drives commitment. Relationship drives commitment. When we are in intimate relationship with people, we are wildly committed and devoted to them. Um, Many of you know I have a friend named James who lives in Florida, and he runs an organization called Neighborly. He was up here a couple times this past year speaking to our church and sharing about the work that he's doing. And when he was here last, we were just driving around running errands, and he said, Brian, I have a favor to ask of you. And I was like, yeah, I'll do anything for you. You just let me know. He's like, there's been some pretty significant transition in my board of my nonprofit over the last year, and I need you to serve on my board. And I go, oh, seriously? Oh. He's like, I know, I know, I know. You, you don't want to do it. I'm like, yes, James, 
I do not want to do this. I do not want to, I love you to death. I do not want to serve on your board. I already serve on a board at our church and I already have two board meetings a month. I don't need to add any more to my plate. I'm overextended as is. And he goes, I know, I know. And I know you don't have time to do this. I'm like, you're right. I don't have time. I'm trying to lead a church. We're going into a capital campaign. I've got a family. I'm busy. I don't have time to do it. He goes, I know you don't want to do it. You don't have time to do it, but you're going to do it, aren't you? <laughs> And I go, yes, I will do it just for one year, right? And the reason why I said yes to him, I didn't want to serve it. I don't serve on his board. I don't have time. When we moved here in 2016, not really knowing what's what, we're like a week into our house. We don't even have curtains up in our house yet. He's the first one to call me to say, hey, just call him to see how it's going. Just wanted to check in and see how you're getting settled. I'm like, oh, it's great. It's this and that. And he's like, all right, go look out your front window. And guess where he is? He's in my front yard saying, hey, I'm here with his wonderful wife, Kristen. We've come to visit. They were living down in Atlanta at the time and drove up just to check in and see how we were doing. We're, we're sitting that week. It was one of those days that was like 49 and gray and cool in June, and we're sitting on this log at Hart Park watching my kids play, and he's like, why did you move here? I'm like, I know. I think because God called me here. He's like, yeah, you better hope he has called you here, you know? <laughs> like, he was in it with me from Atlanta, drove up here just to spend time with me, so naturally, when he said, hey, will you do this, even though I didn't want to, even though I don't have time, I said, yes, because relationship drives commitment. We want to be a church that introduces people to Jesus, brings them into relationship with him, so that they can see and experience the commitment that Jesus has for them. Not because we're deserving, not because we've done anything, but simply because he loves us for who we are. We're His kids. We're His creation. We are made in His image. And we have the opportunity as a church to bring people to Jesus so that they can see and experience and know His love and know His power that is at work within and through us to be extended to them. And so where's God at work in your life? Where do you want to see your conviction grow? Follow your fear. Walk into it knowing that He's with you. Trust the connection that He has and that His love for you is greater and stronger and more powerful than any love you could ever experience. And it will change your life and hopefully the lives of the people around you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up front because we're going to go before the Lord's table. One of the places where we see the commitment that Jesus has for us most vividly is in the communion meal. Because in this meal, we have the representation of Jesus' death for us, his body being ripped apart, his blood flowing freely, all for us who have committed sin in a way that has necessitated his death for us. And so we come before this meal reminding ourselves that Jesus too had courage to face the cross. Because the night before he went to the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and we're told that he's anguishing about what's to come. He's sweating to the point where his sweat is like drops of blood, and he's sorrowful for all that he has to go through. But he does it willingly for us. And so in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward. They're going to dismiss you row by row in the way that we do communion here. So we're going to invite everyone up the front aisle or the middle aisle to come to one of these four stations. They're all the same. Uh, you're going to find two cups stacked on top of each other. One has a piece of bread. One has the juice. Take both cups. There's also prepackaged elements. And we just ask you to go back to your seat through the side aisles, and then I'll come up and lead us in taking it together. If you need help getting elements, just raise your hand, and one of the ushers or somebody around you can get those elements for you. But as we come forward, this is a moment to contemplate and remember the love and the, the commitment that Jesus has to us and the way that he gave everything for us so that we might be in relationship with him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are for what you've done, for how you've been at work in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that in this moment, 
we would be able to sense your spirit. We would help, we, that we would be able to know that we are not alone, that you are a good and faithful God who is gracious to us even when we're unfaithful to you. So Lord, we give ourselves to you in this moment asking that you would continue to work that commitment and that devotion to you deep in our hearts.